I want to welcome you to the service this evening. It's my prayer as we open the Bible and study the Word of God together that it will be a, a great blessing and challenge to all of us. I do want to thank you for your prayers. I was able to make it home safely on Sunday afternoon in the midst of the snowstorm. And uh, boy, what a snowstorm it was. Uh, we had about 15 inches in Chambersburg, and uh, thankfully we were able to dig out and, and uh, get about and do some things. But uh, it has been uh, quite a, a challenge, an, another uh, big snowstorm and all the things that that brought to us. But tonight I want to look at the book of Ephesians once again. You remember that we've been looking at this book and we've challenged you with uh, the thought of the wealth of the believer. And uh, I, I've shared with you the walk of the believer. And uh, also now we're looking at the warfare of the believer. We'll have a word of prayer and get right into the Word of God. Father, I pray your blessing upon the Scriptures this evening. May your Word go forth in power and demonstration of the Spirit of God. And Lord, we recognize our great, great need of you. Pray that you would fill us with the Spirit and use us to proclaim the precious truths of thy word. Help us to be a blessing. Receive all the glory to yourself, and we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we looked at the energy that we need in this spiritual warfare that we are in. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 10, the Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Uh, we learn from this passage of Scripture that we have a provided power for us. It's a gift that God gives to us. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that works in and through the life of every believer in Christ Jesus. Not, not only is it a provided power, but it's also a purposeful power. And then we also learn that it is a plentiful power available to the people of God in order to fight this warfare valiantly and honorably unto the Lord. This evening I want us to look at this passage of Scripture and see the second thing that is very important, and that is the enemy that we face. We not only need the energy that God provides for us, but we also need to know the enemy that we are facing. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, and beginning with verse number 11, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, and against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. God has provided, graciously has provided, everything we need, the resources that we need, in, in order to accomplish His will and stand up against the wiles of the devil. He's provided us the power to do that, and He provides us the honor, armor that is necessary in order for us to stand valiantly for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why the Bible calls upon us to stand. Uh, you'll notice in verse number 11, the Bible says that we might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Then if you drop down to verse number 13, the latter part of that, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And then again in verse number 14, the Bible says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and so forth. And so the Bible is making it very clear that God wants us to stand against the wiles of the devil. That means that you and I are to hold our ground. It means that we are to stand firm in this spiritual warfare in which we are engaged. And we really can't stand firm in the Lord until we are grounded in the Word of the Lord. You can't stand if you're not aware of the armor that He has provided for you and, and that you can stand and having done all to stand. When the Bible talks about the wiles of the devil in verse number 11, he's talking about the trickery of the devil. When he talks about the wiles of the devil, he's talking about his maneuvers of deceit. He's talking about his cunning arts. 
the Lord is reminding us of the methods and the strategies that Satan uses against us in this warfare that we are engaged. And the Bible says that we're to stand against those wiles. All of the trickery and deceit and cunning arts of the devil, we're to stand and having done all to stand. Now, let me remind you this evening that Satan's whole purpose is to destroy Christians and their effective fulfillment of God's will for their life. That's what we're up against this evening. Satan is bound, determined to destroy us. He, he's out to stop us and prevent us and use his trickery and use his deceit and, and use his cunning arts in order to keep us from fulfilling effectively the will of God in our individual life. And I'd be the first to remind you that those attacks that Satan levels against the child of God are, are relentless. And they are going to increase in these last days in which we are living. In the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 1, the Bible says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The activity of the devil is going to increase as we grow closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there's going to be those that will depart from the faith. Uh, there's going to be those that are going to give heed to all of the lies and seductive movements of the devil. And, and they're going to fall prey to all of the doctrines that he promotes in the world. And the command for the child of God, once again, is to stand. We are to resist the devil. We're to stand against the wiles of the devil. And there's some things that we need to consider as we talk about this spiritual warfare that we are engaged in. The first thing that I would say to you is that we need to remember the foe that we encounter. In verse number 11, the Bible says, Put on the whole armor of God, that she may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word devil there is used 35 different times in the Word of God. And it means deceiver. It means accuser. It means the divider. That's what the devil is all about. He wants to deceive people. He wants to accuse people. And he wants to divide people. And he uses his cunning arts and he uses the wiles and methods that he has in his strategies to do that very thing. The Bible also refers to the devil as Satan. The word Satan is used 52 different times in the Word of God. And, and it means adversary. It means opponent. The devil is our adversary and the one that stands in opposition to us. But the Bible also refers to the devil as tempter. And, and when we talk about the tempter, we're talking about the ability of the devil to pierce in order to prove and examine. He wants to tempt us and, and place before us things that will put us to the test, things that will examine our life so that he has something to accuse before you, you accuse you and me before the throne of of grace. Now, there's many titles that we are familiar with that we find in the Word of God that tell us a lot about our enemy. The Bible says in Ezekiel 28 and verse number 14 that he is the anointed cherub. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 2, he's the prince of the world. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 4 that the devil is the god of this world. In Luke chapter 11, in verse number 15, uh, the Bible says that he is the chief of demons. In Revelation chapter 12, and in verse number 9, the Bible refers to the devil as that old serpent. In Revelation 12 and 9, he's also referred to as the great dragon. And 1 Peter chapter 5, and in verse number 8, the devil is referred to as a roaring lion. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 13, the devil is revealed as the wicked one. Those are the titles that God gives to the devil. Those things that will expose him and alert us to the very tactics that he uses in opposition to us. 
But then we also need to be familiar with the character of the devil. In John chapter 8 and verse number 44, the Bible says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And so the Bible says that the character of the devil is he's a murderer. Uh, he's behind the abortion industry. He, he's behind the murder that is, is, is caused in the world. The devil is behind all of that. He's a murderer. And, and, and the Bible refers to him as a liar. And, and the Bible says that he is without truth. And so he's the father of lies. He's a murderer. And there's no truth in the devil. In 1 John chapter 3, in verse number 8, talking about the character of the devil, the Bible says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So it's clear from the word of God that the devil is a liar. The devil has no truth in him. The, the devil is a murderer, and he is one that has sin in himself. He is a sinner. He rebelled against God. Not only did he rebel against God, but he's the leading antagonist against God. Not only that, but he's the ruler of this sinful world system that we are surrounded by. In Revelation chapter 12 and in verse number 10, talking about the character of the devil, the Bible says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Uh, Satan is an accuser. He loves to point fingers at you and loves to point fingers at me. And every time we sin, every time we disobey God, every time we go against what God would really want us uh, to be and what he would really want us to do, it's giving ammunition to the devil in order to stand in the presence of God and point an accusing finger at us. He's the prosecuting attorney of you and the prosecuting attorney of me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse number 13, the Bible says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And so we find from that passage of Scripture, the, the character of the devil is that he's an imitator. He, he wants to imitate and put himself off as something that he really is not. He transforms himself into an angel of light. This idea of the devil having a forked horns out his head and a, and a, a fiery tail uh, on, on his behind has no credence in the Word of God whatsoever. He's an angel, a transformed angel of light. He wants people to see him as an angel of light. But he's not. He's a liar, a deceiver, and, and, and is fostering that on all of humanity. We also need to see the methods of the devil. When you study the scriptures, you discover that he prevents the word of God. In Luke chapter 8 and verse number 12, those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. The devil goes to church, and the devil is present when the word of God is being preached. Uh, the devil is working in order to steal and rob and, and, and take from us the precious word of God that we might not apply it to our life and we might not live it in our life. And so every time the word of God goes forth, the devil is looking for some way to distort that word and prevent that word from finding lodging in our heart 
that you and I might be all that God would have us to be. That's one of his methods. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and beginning with verse number 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world blindeth the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on to them. So Satan is someone that prevents the word of God. He blinds minds. He keeps people away from the truth. He wants to make sure that God's word does not find entrance into the heart and life of the believer, lest they accept it, lest they believe it, and start living by it. Satan not only prevents the word, but Satan perverts the word. When you think about the temptation in the Garden of Eden, uh, the first thing that Satan did was to question the Word of God. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 3 in verse number 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? What he was doing there was questioning what God had said. And, and, and certainly that is a tactic that God uses today. He wants to make sure that he casts doubt upon what God has said in his word, lest we believe it, lest we accept it, lest we live by it, and it becomes the very standard of our life. Not only does Satan question the word of God, but he even denies the word of God. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 4, the Bible says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. That's not what God said. That's what the devil is saying. And he is perverting the word of God by changing it to say what he wants it to say. He substitutes his words for God's word. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 5, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Satan's strategy has always been to do damage to God's Word. He wants people to question the Word of God, the authority of the Bible. He wants people to question the deity of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants people to question the, the corrupt uh, way of, of, of salvation. He wants us to uh, cause our minds to be confused about how people really get saved. And so he works to corrupt the very gift of grace uh, and the very salvation that God's, God's offering to people because of that grace. He wants us to deny the second coming, and he wants to confuse people about the dangers of sin. That's the work of the devil. And Satan blinds minds, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them, and they become believers and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you also this evening that Satan opposes Christians. If you know the Lord as your personal Savior, uh, the devil has his eye upon us, and he wants to bring us down in defeat and discouragement, and he wants to stop us from loving the Lord and serving the Lord. He tempts us. In the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and in verse number 5, the Bible says, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I, I sent to know your affair, your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. What, what Paul is saying in that passage of Scripture is that Satan will move in to a church. He'll move into a, a home. He will move upon the life of those that know Christ and, and try to tempt us and allure us away from the very faith that we profess. He's an accuser. That's what Revelation chapter 12 and in verse number 10 says. He accuses the brethren. He stands before God and has a, a finger pointed at our failures and our shortcomings and our sin, and, and he brings that before God thinking that somehow God will turn on us and will forsake us. I'm thankful that that can't happen. I'm thankful that that won't happen. I'm thankful that God has made us a promise that I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. A perfect example of that is found in the 
book of Zechariah, chapter 3. The Bible says in verse number 1, And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. That's the work of the devil. He wants to accuse you, and he wants to accuse me, and he wants to resist what God is endeavoring to do in and through our life. And so the devil has an accusing finger pointed at you and me. The, the devil opposes the Christians by tempting them. And he also has snares. When the Bible talks about snares, it's talking about the traps of the devil or the noose that he'd like to put around our neck or something that brings peril or loss or destruction. We all face many temptations in the work of God. We face the temptation of discouragement because things don't go quite the way we'd like them to go or as soon as we'd like them to happen. We all face the, the problem of indifference from time to time. We get a little lax and, and, and uh, we get indifferent toward the things of the Lord because of the hardships that we might be for facing. Uh, we sometimes even face laziness because we just, we just don't want to keep on keeping on or the, the problem of compromise, something that is very prevalent in this day in which we are living. These are all traps that Satan uses to bring us down. These are, are, are the very things that, that bring peril and, and loss and destruction into our individual lives. And these are the very traps that Satan uses to prevent us from effectively, valiantly, and faithfully serving the Lord. Satan certainly is one that tries to take advantage of, of our circumstances. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, and in verse number 11, uh, we are confronted with a perfect example of how the devil tries to take advantage of our circumstances. Uh, the problem that Paul was confronting in this passage of Scripture is the problem of a sinning brother. And the church was overlooking that and ignoring that and doing nothing about that. Uh, that is becoming so prevalent in, in so many churches today. They finally listened to the advice of the Apostle Paul and they rose up in arms and they excommunicated this brother from the church. The sinning brother got right with God. He repented of his sin and he sought forgiveness from those that he had, he had offended. Some were willing to forgive and some were unfor unforgiving and not willing to forgive. The response of the Apostle Paul is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and in verse number 7. To the contrary wise, ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. But that's not all that Paul said. He also reminded the church that Satan will take advantage of that unforgiving spirit that you have. He says in verse number 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. If we develop an unforgiving spirit toward someone that is faltered and failed along the journey of life, we're unwilling to forgive them. Satan will take advantage of that and bring great harm and bring great destruction to that individual and, and, and to the church and it, 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 it reaps a, a, a havoc of problems. Refusing to forgive imprisons a person to the past. It produces hatred. An unforgiving spirit produces bitterness. It, it, it produce, produces animosity. It, it, it produces anger. But when we are willing to exercise forgiveness, we are more like God in doing that than at any other time. It certainly follows the example of our Savior, the Lord Jesus, when he cried out on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If we are unwilling to forgive, Satan takes advantage of that and causes a lot of problems and divisions that are unnecessary. 
We are in a spiritual warfare. And we're to give no place to the devil. We're not allow him to get a foothold in our individual life. We're not to allow him to get a, a, a foothold in the church. And certainly we ought not to allow him to get a foothold in our family and cause the problems that come as a result of that. Satan is the enemy that we face. We know his titles. We know his tactics. We know the tragedies that he can cause. And the Bible says that you and I are to stand against the wiles, the methods, the trickery, the deception, the lies, the deceit that Satan would try to bring upon us. I trust, my friend, that you'll take heart to that for the glory of God. Father, bless the Word of God to our hearts tonight. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Keep looking up. Jesus is coming soon.